Hello, welcome to Ancient Text Podcast. Today we'll be examining Book 4 of Historia Regum Britannia. Now, Book 4 is especially crazy to analyze, as most of the events here are also events betrayed in Roman history, but often very differently. Keep in mind here, our goal on the show is to take this book for face value and try to make it sound cohesive and realistic as possible, even if it's a little hard. So guess who's making a guest appearance on the book this week? Julius Caesar. Geoffrey says that after we left off on last book, is about the time Caesar was out and about doing his shenanigans, massacring, sorry, I meant conquering Gaul. Once he was to the western shore across from Britain, he inquired what the island was. I guess I have to read this dubious Caesar quote because we're trying to take this book seriously, as I said. Anyways, Geoffrey says that after being informed of Britain and its history, Caesar realizes that they're of the same origin, both descended from the Trojans, and that while the Romans were descended from Aeneas, the Britons were descended from Brutus. Caesar doubted they knew much about war since they lived on an isolated island. I guess Caesar didn't know, or thought, just thought that Brennius was a Celt, as opposed to earlier in this book, where Brennius is obviously portrayed as a, as a Briton. You know, the guy who invaded Rome and took over for a bit. Okay, anyways. Caesar thought that Britain could easily be reduced to a client state or make them pay a tribute. Caesar said, we'll warn them first, and if they'll just pay us, we won't have to set foot on the island, so we won't have to slaughter our kinsmen. So, he had a letter set to Castle Bellon, describing his terms, and Caesar received this message in response. We cannot but wonder, Caesar, at the extreme greed of the Roman people, since their insatiable thirst for money cannot leave us alone, though the dangers of the oceans have places in an isolated place. The Romans still covet our stuff, which we will have until now enjoyed in quiet. This is not sufficient for you. We must choose subjugation to you Romans before we're allowed to enjoy our native liberty. Your demand, therefore, Caesar, is scandalous, since the same vein of nobility flows between our two peoples. We have the same ancestors. We have ought to be friends. Instead, you demand of us slavery. We have learned to make friends, but not to be slaves. Insomuch that we are accustomed to liberty, that we are perfectly ignorant of what it means to submit to slavery. Even if the gods themselves should attempt to deprive us of our liberty, we would, to the utmost of our power, resist them in defense. Know then, Caesar, that we are ready to fight for that and our kingdom, if, as you threaten, you shall attempt to invade Britain. End quote. While we're between chapters here, it's probably good to point out that Caesar did invade Britain according to Roman academic history. We'll contrast and compare each part as they happen. Upon receiving that huge fuck you of a letter, Caesar got his fleet ready and waited for the right winds to invade Britain. He successfully sailed across the sea and arrived at the mouth of the river Thames, which is near Trinovantum, the capital of course. They came to land and Castle Bellon headed towards the Romans with his forces. Along the way, in the town of Dorabellum, he consulted with his nobility how to drive out the enemy. His general Belinus was there, whose counsel was highly respected, among other nobles and lesser kings. They all seemed to agree that they should march directly to Caesar's camp and get rid of him before they could capture any cities or towns, you know. The plan was agreed upon by all, and they advanced towards the shore where Caesar had pitched his camp. Both armies drew out for battle, and the fight began. The dead bodies on both sides piled up fast, and it was a rough battle. Then the citizens of Canterbury and Trinovantum, commanded by Nennius and Androgius, came up to the battle. They saw that they were near the battalion with Caesar himself present in it, and assaulted them. Caesar's battalion was nearly routed, but not quite. Nennius, seizing Caesar, thought it'd be cool to try to swing his sword at such a famous guy, so he went for it. Caesar saw Nennius coming for him, so he blocked with his shield and struck Nennius on his helmet going in for a second and final blow. Caesar's sword was impelled on Nennius' shield, and he couldn't pull it out. Being disarmed, Caesar just took off behind his men. Nennius was able to pry the sword from his shield and use it to wreak havoc upon enemy troops, killing everyone he hit. Then he kills a tribune named Labinus, which is weird because Labinus is an actual historical figure that... I think he lived longer than Caesar himself, anyways. At last, after the day was spent in bloody battle, the Britons made the Romans flee. Caesar took to his ships and left. At the telling of the first Roman invasion of Britain, in Caesar's own words, in his own Bella di Gallica, which we might do that book on this show eventually, even though it's overdone, 
still might do it. Anyways, in Bella di Gallica, Caesar first sets sail to Britain and his ships are messed up by unsuspected winds. Only a portion of his forces land so they can barely establish a camp, then is easily forced to retreat and sail off. So Caesar's book, Bella di Gallica, has the same ending to the first invasion, but a different build-up and story. Basically, you can see it is like he has the excuse of, oh, I lost half my guys anyway. Back to Castle Bellion. Proud of his win over Caesar, he thanked God, which this book's going to get more monotheistic from here out. We're approaching 0 AD. And rewarded his compatriots according to how well they had performed. However, his brother Nennius was mortally wounded from the, that bonk Caesar had given him. After 15 days, Nennius died, and he was buried at Trinovantum. The sword he had caught in his shield, Caesar's sword, was buried with him. The sword was allegedly called Yellow Death, as it killed anybody it wounded. After Caesar had fled and arrived on the Gallic coast, the Gauls attempted to rebel against him. They thought he was extremely weakened from the short adventure in Britain. The Celts also heard that Castle Bellon was on his way to continental Europe to finish Caesar off. The Celts got cocky and decided to keep away Caesar from the coast so he couldn't land. Caesar made appeals to the royalty of Gaul in the form of money and concessions to the commoners in the form of freeing slaves. He barely managed to pacify the Celts. They let him land back on the continent. In the meantime, Julius Caesar sat and stewed over his defeat in Britain. Two years later, Caesar prepared to cross the sea to Britain again. Casabellon was acutely aware of Caesar's intentions, so he fortified his towns and placed men at seaports. In the River Thames, which was thought to be an obvious way to get to the capital, Trinovantum, Casabellon made giant wooden and lead stakes, and he placed them in the river so that they would like, act like pikes and hit, hit, the, hit the boats, Caesar's boats, as they came in. The king then assembled all his armed forces and placed them along the sea in anticipation of an armed invasion. Caesar had procured all necessary provisions and a huge army and sailed to Britain with vengeance on his mind. The people of Britain would be doomed if the ships managed to land, but Caesar sailed up the Thames, and as predicted, many of his ships were destroyed by those those spike traps Castle Bellon had set. Caesar and his remaining forces hastened to get ashore. Castle Bellon laughed and commanded these landing soldiers to be attacked. The fight was not an easy one, but given the Britons had much more reinforcements after the loss of so many ships on the Romans' part, the Romans lost the battle and Caesar with some men fled on the ships. Caesar fled to a tower fortress he had built named Anya, which, had, which he had built in case the, the Gauls decided to not let him back again. Castle Bellon, proud of his victory, decreed all the nobility of Britain must come to Trinovantum to perform sacrifices to the gods, who had allowed them to obtain a victory over such a famous general. Indeed, they came and sacrificed hundreds of thousands of animals and had a subsequent feast. During the festivities, two noble youths, one a nephew of the king and one a nephew of the duke Androgius, had a wrestling match and afterwards disputed about who had won. As they were arguing, the duke's nephew, Evelinus, pulled out his sword and decapitated his rival. The whole court erupted at this barbarity. The king ordered Evelinus to appear before him so that punishment, if necessary, should be decided. Adrogius, being suspicious of the king's biases, you know, it's killed his nephew, not his, you know, replied that his nephew should be tried in his court in his dukedom, and that he, if he was found guilty, he would ship his nephew back up to Trinovantum for punishment, all of which was allegedly according to custom. Castle Bellon, seeing he wasn't going to get his way, threatened to come and take Adrogius' dukedom by force. Adrogius was incensed and kind of like, yeah, sure, fuck you, man. Castle Bellon, doubly incensed in turn, made good on his threats. Androgius petitioned the crown daily to not go through with this. He didn't have means to make war with the High King and the whole war seemed really dumb in the first place. Having no viable options, he decided to write Caesar a letter. It reads, Androgius, Duke of Trinovantum, to Caesar. Instead of wishing death as I did formerly, I now wish you health. I repent that I ever acted against you when you were made war against the king. Had I never been guilty of such exploits, you would have vanquished Castle Bellon. He is so swollen with pride since his victory that he is endeavoring to drive me out of his coasts, me, who procured him that triumph. Is this a fit reward for my services? 
I have settled him in an inheritance, and he endeavors to disinherit me. I have a second time restored him to the kingdom, and he de- endeavors to destroy me. All this I have done for him in fighting against you. I call the gods to witness. I have not deserved this anger. Unless I could be said to deserve it for refusing to deliver up my nephew, who he would have unjustly sentenced to death, of which that you may be better able to judge. Here is the account of the matter. I'm sure this is not going to be biased. It happened that, for the joy of victory, we performed solemn honors to our gods, in which, after we had finished our sacrifices, our youth began to divert themselves to sports. Among the rest, our two nephews, encouraged by the example of others, entered a wrestling match. And when mine had got the better, the other, without any cause, was incensed and attacked my nephew with a sword, who was a- almost able to wrestle it from the other's hands. In this struggle, the king's nephew fell on the sword and died. This is very much a lie. This is, he's lying. <laughs> this is funny. When the king was informed of this, he commanded me to deliver up the youth that he may be punished for murder. I refused to do it, and he invaded my provinces with all his forces and has given me great disturbance, so I'm flying to your clemency. I desire your assistance, that by you I may be restored to my dignity, and by me you may gain possession of Britain. Let no doubts or suspicion of treachery in this matter detain you. Be influenced by the common motive of mankind. Let past amenities beget a desire of friendship, and after a defeat make you eager for more glory. That was it's the long letter where he lied a lot, and sold out his own country what a what a cool guy okay caesar having read the letter was advised not to go into britain upon a bare verbal invitation and that the duke should send political hostages first adrogius accordingly set his son Sfeba and 30 other young noblemen upon delivery of the hostages caesar no longer suspicious or reassembled his forces and with fair wind arrived at the port of the rutipi which would be east of modern Canterbury. <clears throat> in the meantime, Castle Belon besieged Trinovantum, trying to take it from Androgius. Castle Belon then heard that Caesar had arrived, so he abandoned his siege and hastened to meet Caesar. They met in a valley near modern Canterbury. Castle Belon saw the Roman army preparing their camp. The Romans, seeing the Britons advancing towards them, grabbed their weapons and got into battle formation. Androgius, with 5,000 men, was hiding in some woods nearby ready to render assistance to Caesar. Both armies now approached and began to fight. There was much bloodshed on both sides. Then Androgius came out of the woods and hit the back of Castle Belon's army. Flanked, Castle Belon fled with his men to the top of a nearby mountain, where he was able to defend himself, because, you know, ancient warfare, when you're, when you're uphill, it's a, it's a good position to be in. So, Caesar besieged the entire mountain and decided to starve out the king of the Britons since he had failed to kill him by the sword. Castle Belon had evaded Caesar's tyranny three times now. Castle Belon, after two days, realized that he was screwed. His forces were beginning to go hungry, so he wrote a letter to Adrasia saying, okay, I guess I'll make a deal with that snake Caesar. If I'm captured, it's an egg on the whole country's face. I don't think I deserve to be chased down to death. Adrasia replies with a long letter, and I'm not going to read another long letter from that guy, because I didn't like the last one anyways, but... He suffice to say, he says, yeah, sure, I guess you begging me for mercy is enough revenge. I'll go talk to Caesar. So Drosius went to Caesar and said, you have sufficiently revenged yourself upon Castle Belon. Now let clemency take place of vengeance. What more is there to be done than to make him submissively pay a tribute to the Roman state? Caesar didn't reply, so Drosius addressed him again. My whole engagement with you, Caesar, was only to reduce Britain under your power. By the submission of Castle Belon, look, Castle Belon is now vanquished, and Britain, by any assistance, becomes subject to you. What further service do I owe you? God forbid that I should suffer my king who sues me for peace, that he might imprison me for all this. I'm not going to let you kill him. If we can't reach an agreement here, I'm back on his side. Caesar, alarmed at this, complied and made peace with Castle Belon, on the condition that he pays a yearly tribute of 3,000 pounds of silver. Julius and Castle Belon actually became friends and sent each other gifts. Caesar spent that winter in, in Britain and in spring returned to Gaul. He would soon after march for Rome and fight against Pompey, as is told in Roman history. Seven years after this, Castle Belon died and was buried at York. 
He was succeeded by Tenautus, who was the brother of Adrogius, as Adrogius had gone to Rome with Caesar. Tenautus, now wearing the crown, governed his kingdom well. He was a warlike man and a proponent of justice. After him, his son Cimbalinus was advanced to the throne and, according to the book, was brought up by Augustus Caesar, which is a weird thing to... Under him, the national friendship with Rome was strong enough that Britain paid tribute merely as an honorable promise, not under threat. Now, Geoffrey casually mentions that this was around a time when Christ lived, which, yeah, around after the time of Augustus would be indeed the same general time frame. Kimbolinus, after he had ruled for ten years, had two sons, the older named Gidarius, the other, Aravagus. The kingdom was inherited by Gidarius. Gidarius refused to continue paying tribute to the Romans, so Emperor Claudius invaded, which I think was an actual thing that happened in Roman history too, accompanied by a general named Louis Hamo. They sailed to Port Chester in Britain and began to build walls around the city as to imprison the inhabitants. Hamo was determined to either enslave them or kill them. Gadarius, when he heard the Romans had come, assembled all the soldiers and went to meet the Roman army. In the ensuing battle, Gadarius began the assault ferociously, killing tons of men by himself. The Romans were fleeing to their ships, almost entirely defeated, when Hamo changed his armor with that of a Briton's. He was able to infiltrate deep into the British ranks and, in disguise, assassinated the king Gadarius and quickly escaped into the Roman ranks to tell them to stop running away because he had just assassinated the enemy king. Aravagus, the late king's brother, saw the king dead, so he took the clothes off the corpse and put them on and pretended to be his brother and led his men so that they didn't get all bummed out about their king being dead so they would keep fighting. So despite the resurgence of the Roman troops, the Britons were able to hold their ground and eventually broke the Romans. Claudius fled to his ships with one part of the troops, and Hamo fled to the woods with another part. Aravagus pursued Hamo to modern Southampton, where, again, his forces were defeated. And just before Hamo could flee on a merchant ship, he was killed by Aravagus, the new king himself. Geoffrey claims that the place was then called Hamo's Port, though I can't seem to find any historical information about anything called Hamo's Port. In the meantime, Claudius, with his remaining forces, attacked the town of Porchester as per the original plan. All the Britons had pursued Hamo, so they were free to do so, and the Romans successfully took the town. After Claudius pursued Aravagus, who was in Winchester, Claudius laid a successful siege. Aravagus came out of the town with all his forces ready to battle. Claudius then sent a message to his enemy that they could have had peace if they just merely submitted to the tribute that had been established generations ago, you know. Claudius also said, hey, I'll also give you uh, one of my daughters to marry. All Aura Vargas had to do was acknowledge that he was a subject of Rome. The British nobles convinced the king at length that this was a good deal, so he took it. Together, Aura Vargas and Claudius conquered the Orkney Isles, which is uh, the, the islands north of, of Scotland, which might just seem like a random factoid to inject at the end of a story, but that's actually how it was written in the book. It's like they became friends, and then they conquered other places <laughs> together. <laughs> After that winter was over, Claudius had brought his daughter into Britain as promised. She was apparently a super hot chick, and after marrying her, all Aravargus cared about was her, to the point it was a problem. He allowed a city built by Claudius upon the spot they were married. Geoffrey says this was called Caglau, and it is now Glaucester. But that others say it came from the name of a duke named Glaucus, who was a son of Claudius that was born there. Peace came to the islands now, and Claudius returned to Rome, leaving Aravargus as the governor slash king type thing. Geoffrey says at this time, Peter founded the Church of Antioch and later became the Bishop of Rome. After Claudius had left, Aravargus began to build back his country strong, a little too strong, to the point it worried neighboring kingdoms. In a state of pride, the king started to despise Roman power and stopped paying the Romans any mind or cash assuming his right to rule as king. Vespasian was sent to procure a reconciliation with the British king, or to invade otherwise. Vespasian arrived at the port in a British town called Ritupi. Aravargus met him, and with a huge army prevented the Romans from landing at the port. Vespasian withdrew and changed course to Totnes, 
Once he had landed, he marched directly to besiege. This is a hell of a city name. Care Fenelgoit. And then one called Exeter. And after besieging them for seven days, was confronted by Ara Vargas and his army. The battle was even, and nobody won. They just stopped fighting at night. The next morning, by mediation of the queen, who, remember, was a Roman by birth, the two leaders came to be friends, and together invaded Ireland. <laughs> this, this is a great common theme. This is actually, they just became friends of the Roman invader and then invaded somewhere else. There are so many strange stories in this book. It may sometimes seem like sometimes I'm misinterpreting something, which I probably have a few times, but no. The stories in here are very strange and sometimes only seem to halfway make sense. Vespasian returned home. Ara Vargas continued to rule, and he confirmed the old laws of his ancestors and enacted some new ones and gave great gifts to all persons of merit. His fame, according to Geoffrey, spread all over Europe. He was respected by the Romans and was talked about by them more than any other king of the time. Accordingly, there was a common poem. Ara Vargas shall from his chariot fall, or thee his lord some captive king shall call. He was a respected king generally, and when he died he was buried at Gloucester, in a temple he had built and dedicated to his friend the Roman Emperor Claudius. His son Marius took the throne, who was a man of prudence and wisdom. In this time, Geoffrey claims the Picts sailed to Alba from Scythia. This is quite the claim. Most modern historians just assume the Picts are descendants of earlier Brythonic tribes. However, we're here to take this book seriously as possible, so I'm going to casually point out the Scythians were from around the Caucasus and steppes, which is where green eyes and Indo-European people originated, so there could be a point there. It should be pointed out, the also ancient historian Bede, who is much more respected by modern historians than Joffrey, also said the Picts came from Scythia, as do some other ancient texts. But this is written right off by most modern historians. Anyways, these alleged Scythians started to raid and pillage Alba. Marius got all his men and handily defeated them in battle, and killed their king. After building a monument to himself, oh, okay, he gave the surviving defeated Scythians liberty to settle in Cathnice, which is the northeasternmost part of modern Scotland. As the land was unsettled and considered bad lands, however, the Picts who originally came to fight, now settling in an alien land granted liberty by those who had defeated them, didn't bring any chicks. So they asked the Britons for some brides. The Britons said, no, you gross. So the Picts sailed into Ireland to find brides. Green eyes, remember? Geoffrey now digresses that he's not here to write an entire history of the Picts, but Geoffrey does say the Picts eventually evolved to be the Scots. Marius, meanwhile, continued paying his owed tribute to the Romans and ruled well as king, exercising justice and peace in the entire island of Britain. Once Marius died, Coelus became king. He was raised in Rome and was Roman in his mannerisms and continued to pay tribute to the Romans as he thought he ought to. His reign was quiet and peaceful, and he got along with lower nobility. Coelus had only one son who was named Lucius. He rose to the crown after his father died and continued to rule as a goodly king as his father had. He was interested in Christianity, so he reached out to Pope Eleutherius. According to Geoffrey, because Lucius had heard so many nations converting in the Acts of the Apostles. King Lucius, by the way, is actually credited with introducing Christianity into Britain by many texts. And that Christianity was present in Britain by most accounts before the year 200, when persecutions of Christians by the Roman Empire were still present, and 700 years before Christianity started spreading amongst Germanic and Scandinavian peoples. In time, both the Brythonic peoples and Ireland would be important proponents of Christianity, leading later to disputes with Catholicism, as Catholicism was hardly even coherently formed at this point, leading to differences in practices. And different dates for Easter and Christmas, you know, they would like line it up to the, the solstice, as it was probably originally meant to do, um, which later on Catholic missionaries would come in and be like, hey, no, do this the right way. Anyways, back to the book. The Pope sent two skilled missionaries named Faganus and Duvenus, who after preaching to the king baptized him. Many followed the king's example, and the missionaries converted much of the island of Britain. Temples were repurposed for monotheism, and high priests were made into archbishops. Geoffrey claims in his time 
28 dioceses were founded. However, large churches don't appear in the archaeological record until a couple hundred years later. The Roman missionaries being successful left, and other ones would in the future come. Though Geoffrey seems to claim all this, all this the, the entire Christianization of Britain, he just claims it happens like in one generation, which it probably took a few generations. Again, the oldest churches on the island are from a couple hundred years later. That's a book four. Please join us next time when we do book five of Historia Regum Britannia.